Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us and me. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and you did a lot of great work. Thank you, Mr. Yannis. Thank you all. So yeah, we're going to talk about ethics and code. So before I start, how many of you have taken at least one class about learning how to code? Yeah, I think that's almost everyone here. And how many of you, as part of learning how to code, learned any ethics around that, any formal training? That's actually really impressive. Um, I would like to talk to you after. I might say something contrary to that here. We'll see. <laughs> but first, hi, um, I'm Abby. Oh, that didn't change here. There we go. Hi. I'm Abby. Um, that's a volcano. If you want to talk to me about that later. <laughs> um, yeah, I run the open source engagement programs at the Mozilla Foundation. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I care about ethics and a bit of history about myself. So I studied computer science and bioinformatics, and I started my career writing software at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research in the Mars Building super close by. And um, that was actually really, yeah, I loved that job. It was really powerful for me. Um, my grandmother had passed away from cancer, and the idea that the software that I was writing was helping someone else's grandma, uh, that was really meaningful for me. But the longer I stayed in academia, uh, the more I realized, and this never happened in my lab, um, or OICI, but um, the more I realized people, how often people like, tweak their data, fudge their results, or play the stats a little bit, um, and sometimes even just hide entire data sets. And they do this for their own personal gain, to get published, to get tenure. And this is at the expense of real innovation. Um, that's not going to help someone's grandma find some treatment. So. That's actually why I moved to Mozilla. Uh, the idea, they had an open science program, they still have it, um, in this open source work. And I think that by being open, that helps combat a little bit of that, helps give you some responsibility there. And so I care about ethics because when you don't have integrity behind the data or the facts that we're presenting to the world, we're hindering real innovation in our society. So ethics, stepping back a little bit, is defined as moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity from the Oxford Online Dictionaries, which apparently is different from the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> Did not realize that until I was putting the slide together. But you see this happening in the news a lot, the idea with code and ethics. So with Facebook fake news, uh, did the spread of fake news on Facebook affect the US presidential election last year? Uh, you see this with bias in machine learning, where things like facial detection doesn't see certain races, or it classifies them as not human, um, or any time we're giving a machine decision-making power, um, there's a lot of ethical problems there. And that's carried over to self-driving cars. We're making just, like life and death decisions whenever we drive, so how should a car decide for us? But what's a little alarming is this attitude that I see among developers where it's not my job to know this. It's not my job to think about the ethical implications of what I'm making. So, um, yeah, Jim Adler wrote this program that actually predicts someone's likelihood to commit a felony based on things like their gender, hair color, and tattoos. And this quote that he gave to Bloomberg was, it's not our job to figure out if it's right or not. We often don't know. Um, and then there's this make fast or break things. I, I actually like that. There's some good things that come out of making things quickly and iterating. Um, but this is from a Facebook employee after the spread of fake news on Facebook said, uh, we started out in a dorm. I mean, come on, our Facebook. We never intended to deal with this. And you don't see this attitude in all other professions. So you have doctors who have the Hippocratic Oath. They, it essentially is do no harm. So they, they, yeah, they get trained to do that, and they take responsibility for that. Lawyers get called to the bar. There's often an ethical review board or a lawyer's oath that they have to go through. Even engineers here in Canada, at least, have the iron ring. Um, I know some of us are software engineers. So I don't, I don't have an iron ring. But it's, it's a good reminder that if you're building something in the real world, it has real implications for people, like a bridge, a building. So then with software, there's this lack of responsibility behind what we're doing, I think, in today's culture. Also, I went to school quite a long time ago, so maybe it's up and updated. These people that said, no? OK. <laughs> but I think that we should be part of this conversation. When we leave it to someone else, they often they're not quite equipped to understand all the implications of the software that we're writing, especially around things like privacy and security, I think. So, the good news is that you can join this conversation today. It's happening many places. Um, this is an interesting one, the Moral Machine, it's put on by MIT, 
And um, yeah, this website for both discussing the idea of ethics and code, but also it's a crowdsourced platform for human opinion on how machines should make these decisions. So we're gonna do a fun exercise with the group here. So there's two options. What should the self-driving car do? So should the self-driving car run into the two pedestrians and I think one of them is a thief, based on the money bag that he's holding, but I'm not sure. <laughs> or should the self-driving car run into the wall um, and killing the two people in the car? So how many people think it should go to the pedestrians? No one's raising their hand. How many think it should run into the wall? Okay, a few people. How many people don't want to make this decision? <laughs> Quite a lot more. Um, so you can actually go to the moral machine yeah. Oh yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, stop. Hmm? Yeah, the car stop. No, I think that's the problem. Like, oh. There's no stopping involved. It's between these two options. Yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. So you can go there and actually help crowdsource this platform. So that will help inform these algorithms and what to do. Another place uh, where you can participate is uh, FATML, which stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. So this is a group that's uh, yeah, they've put together principles for accountable algorithms and social impact statements for algorithms. Um, I'll go through them real quickly. So the responsibility, I think this one's important. It takes away your ability to say, oh, the algorithm did that, made that choice. But say that there's someone who wrote the algorithm who should be responsible for that. Um, explainability, make sure that you can explain what the algorithms are doing and the data behind it to the general public. Accuracy, being able to identify and articulate any errors or um, uncertainty. Auditability, having a third party come in and audit what you've done. And fairness, make sure that the algorithm decisions don't uh, create any discriminatory or unjust impacts. Um, yeah, across the different demographics like race and sex. So they're also soliciting feedback, so back on the other slide. Yeah, there's a feedback form. So this is a good place if you're really interested in this, join in their discussion. And I think the people in this room have the kind of expertise to like weigh in on this. Other places, if you want to use your software skills for doing good, there's a lot of organizations that do that. There's Data for Good, which is the Canadian branch of DataKind. And they're harnessing the power of data science in the service of humanity. So I'm going to read their taglines again. Um, big in the news lately is Data Refuge. So they're building refuge for federal climate and environmental data. I don't know if you realized, um, there was opendata.gov. Recently, it got completely, like it's, it's empty right now. <laughs> it's a little scary um, with the new, uh, new administration. So but Data Refuge, they gathered it all before it disappeared. So you can help out with that. And you just pretty much scrape websites and get all the data. Um, I was talking to some people here yesterday to talk about Tech Solidarity, which I didn't know about, um, which is really a grassroots organization to connect tech workers with the communities that they live in. It's another cool place to join in. And I, I would throw Mozilla in there, and I'm biased, I work there. But like, I think that's a big reason why I'm at Mozilla, because we are, it is, yeah, doing this for good, and I think they have an ethical compass. Okay. Um, and before I end, I just wanted to go through this code of ethics that someone has written for software developers. Uh, this is one, the, the IEEE also has one, this was the shortest one, so it fit all in one slide. But it goes through things, very small on my screen, so I'm just going to look this way. But the main one I think is contributing to society and human well-being. Um, and another one I want to highlight is respecting the privacy of others, not their confidentiality. I think these are things that are really hot topics today, and I think we should be remembering this as we're building software that people use. So thank you all so much. If you're interested, I have lots of links and references because I just want to. There's a lot going on, so I'll tune out my slides, and you can go look there. So thanks everyone.